Hello, I'm Dr. Ken Landa. Thanks for watching. Let's talk about suicide. It's a very important condition. 45,000 people die because of suicide every year in the United States. The Centers for Disease Control, they say there's been a 30% increase between the years 1999 and 2016. That increase involved 44 states. 25 of the states, the increase was more than 30%. Worldwide, 800,000 to a million people commit suicide each year. And by 2020 or 2021, it's estimated that number is probably going to be as high as 1,500,000. Here in the country, it's the 10th leading cause of death. The overall rate is relatively stable at somewhere between 15 and 20 per 100,000 over the, the period of the past century. But recently, we've had an increase in the incidence of suicide in adolescence associated with a slight decrease in senior citizens. Now, 50% of the people who commit suicide were seen by a doctor within the past month. And that includes up to 25 to 30% who saw a mental health professional. But yet, when we look at the records, there was no discussion, at least as noted or documented, that the doctor inquired about suicide, and the patient certainly didn't volunteer that they were considering that. Suicide's not a specific disease, but it's really a manifestation of a series of underlying disorders. When we evaluate people, it seems that at the time of death, there was a diagnosis of depression in only about 50% of the people. But if we do a forensic autopsy where information is gathered from family and friends and coworkers, seems like about 90% of the people really suffered from depression at the time of their death. Now, depression is very common, but suicide is relatively rare. So the question is, who's at greatest risk? Well, people with other coexisting factors and conditions, including, but not limited to, anxiety and agitation and poor impulse control. But we don't have any great ability to predict who's at greatest risk. There are no algorithms to assist us, no laboratory, no clinical predictors. And then we have barriers to self-disclosure of people. So there are cultural, moral reasons that people don't suggest that they might be at risk. And in a study uh, looking at almost 2,000 people who were suffering from depression, who were in therapy for depression, 46 committed suicide, and they weren't predicted even under the best of circumstances. Now, in past times, suicide was considered illegal and people were tried posthumously by coroner's juries and they were found guilty of a crime of fellow decide and their property was confiscated by the government. Now, of course, we don't do that. The incidents peaked in the five years between 1985 and 1990 and by 2000, the rate had decreased to the level in 1980. Then the rate continued to decrease until about 2004. In 2004, the FDA mandated a black box warning on popular antidepressants suggesting that their use might be associated with an increased incidence of suicide. And indeed, with that black box warning, we saw an increase in the incidence of suicide. Now, whether the cause and effect relationship is argued, and there's a wide variation of suicide, by the way, between different countries, even here in the United States, depending on where you happen to be. So the highest risk in the United States is in Alaska and Nevada and New Mexico and Montana. In places like New York and New Jersey and Massachusetts, it's only about a third as much. There's a fourfold variation if you go from Washington, D.C., where the incidence is very low, to Montana, where the incidence is very high. And the recent past, the incidence of suicide has gone up, especially in states like Utah and Idaho and Montana and Wyoming, North and South Dakota and Minneapolis. Now it's more common in the Western United States than it is in the South or the Midwest or the New England states. Interestingly, suicide is higher, at least if we talk about incidence, in small towns and rural communities with less than 50,000 population. The rate is almost 20 per 100,000. If we go to mid-sized cities, between 250,000 and a million, 
the rate is a little less than 17 per 100,000. And actually, the least incidence is in large urban areas, large metropolitan areas with population more than a million, where the incidence of suicide is a little less than 13 per 100,000. So we go from an incidence of 20 per 100,000 in the rural areas to the metropolitan areas, a little less than 13 per 100,000. But that doesn't have anything to do with the total number. Because obviously, the big cities have a greater number of people. So where we have the most number of people, that's where we have the most number if we just count the number. So in large urban areas with population more than a million, over the period between 2001 and 2015, that's a 15-year period, there were 250,000 suicides in the United States in big cities. If we go to cities between 250,000 and a million, there were 173,000 suicides here in the United States. And if we look at the rural areas with less than, fewer than 50,000 people, still there were about 115,000 suicides in that 15-year period. So the total overall was about 550,000 suicides between 2001 and 2015 here in the United States with the change in men increasing at the rate of about 1% per year and in women the rate is increasing at a rate of about 2.5% a year. Now overall in the world there's about a tenfold variation in the incidence of suicide. Countries with the highest rate are Sri Lanka and China and South Korea and Japan. And interestingly, as in most of the rest of the world, Suicide is more common in women than it is in men, and it increases in the incidence in women over time, over age, as they grow older. Well, it doesn't necessarily increase in men. Now, the countries at highest risk overall are Lithuania and Latvia and Estonia and Russia and Belarus. But it's also very common in Finland and Denmark and Hungary and Germany and Sweden. Interestingly, migrants and first-generation Americans they have a rate of suicide closer to the country of origin, but it's subsequent generations where they assume the rate typical of the United States. Now, if we look at age, so in people less than age 14, suicide is pretty rare. Not unheard of, but rare. But between 15 and 24 years of age, the rate of suicide already is 10 per 100,000. If we look at people between 25 and 34, the incidence is slightly less than 14 per 100,000. That's the significant group. That's the third largest age group as far as suicide. The greatest number of suicides occur in those people between the ages of 35 and 64, where the incidence is about 17 per 100,000, and it falls only slightly among senior citizens who are over age 65, where it's 15 plus per 100,000. So it's rare in pu pubertal individuals. It's the second or the third leading cause of death in people between the ages of 10 and 26. That's because they're otherwise healthy. And if we look at trends, it seems that the risk is becoming the highest in people between the ages of 45 and 64 compared to all other individuals. Now, if we look at people over age 65, we find that the rate varies depending on how old they are. So between 65 and 85, the rate increases in Caucasian men from 20 per 100,000 to 50 per 100,000. That's about a two and a half fold increase. Increases twice in black men between the ages of 65 and 85, but only increases from eight per 100,000 to 16 per 100,000. And there is no similar increase in women. So worldwide, it seems that the peak age of suicide is about 40. Average range, 30 to about 49. But now we're seeing more suicides in younger people and adolescents, and we're seeing a significant increase in the incidence in senior citizens. Well, in areas of high income, like in the United States, it seems like completed suicides occur four to five times more commonly in men than women, but attempts are three times more common in women than in men. Now, if we go to low and middle income countries, there's only a slight difference, maybe a two to one difference. Part of the reason in the United States is that women are more likely to seek help if they have depression. The sick role is less uncomfortable to women than it is in men. Women's have, women have better uh, family support, 
friends support, they like to discuss their feelings, they choose lethal, less lethal methods of suicide. They oftentimes take pills, and pills are among the suicide attempts, so they're, they're less likely to cause death. Unfortunately, in women we're seeing an increase in the use of guns. Race has something to do with it. So if we're talking about Caucasians, the incidence is more than 19 per 100,000. It's only about a third as much in blacks and in Hispanics, where the incidence of suicide averages about 7 per 100,000. If we look overall in society, more common in those who are widowed, divorced, or separated compared to people who are single and more common in single people than in married individuals and has the lowest risk in those who are married who have young children. The risk seems to have something to do with social isolation from family and friends and relatives, has to do with bereavement, low personal self-esteem, there's little family support. Also, sexual orientation has something to do with it. So people who are involved in same-sex relationships are three or four times greater risk of suicide than people in heterosexual relationships. The incidence appears to be higher in gay men than it is in gay women. It's more common in Protestants and Jews than it is in Catholics, and it's least common in Muslims and highest in Native Americans. It can occur any time during the course of the year, but seems to peak during the springtime and the summer, least common in the winter. When we talk about suicide, obviously, it all depends on your perspective, so historical, or sociocultural, or genetic, or epidemiological, or biochemical, have all different ways to look at it, but suicide is rarely the result of one factor. We have some predisposing factors, and we have some precipitating factors that have to be considered. So everyone has risk factors, but the overwhelming majority of people who have risk factors don't act on them. So in a population, level, we consider, well, economic problems, so unemployment, the media. So we have media reports of people who commit suicide. And there's a parallel increase in the incidence of suicide in the community, especially if the suicide was romanticized versus the reports suggested that there was mental illness and talked about the adverse consequences on the survivors. Certainly, there's more increase in those people who commit suicide who were celebrities. So after Kate Spade or Robin Williams or Anthony Bourdain, there was a spike in the suicides. And then we have the indigenous populations, problems with assimilation a greater disruption of their roots, forced resettlement over a period of time. Genetics have a lot to do with suicide. So we have monozygous twins, identical twins, more likely to commit suicide, say, than diazotic or fraternal twins. Overall, genetics seems to account for as much as 50% of all suicides. And the correlation appears to be most between the biologic parents, not the adoptive parents. That's interesting. So, you also have to consider, what do the genes give you? Well, the genes give an individual the tendency to develop a mood disorder or an impulsive, aggressive behavioral style, personality disorders. But the family itself is very important. In addition, the family can increase the risk of suicide anywhere between 2 and 12 times got to do with a family environment where there's a lot of modeling and imitation. There's an elevated risk of suicide if your partner or your parents or your children commit suicide. And certainly there are more attempts, more number of attempts, in those people with that kind of a family history. Well, if we look at the childhood of people who commit suicide, there's more parental neglect, more childhood abuse, whether we're talking about physical or emotional or sexual abuse. And the likelihood of suicide depends on the type of neglect and abuse and the frequency of abuse and the relationship of the individual with the person who abused them. Seems that all of this has an effect on the development of the prefrontal cortex and that has to do with cognitive deficits and uh, problems in, in memory, difficulty in problem solving 
has to do with early onset of psychiatric disease. And then that all has to do with reaction to later life stresses and impulsive behaviors. So now we know that early life abuse seems to alter the genes through what we call epigenetic pathways. And that involves genes that are involved in neuronal protection and plasticity and growth, all of which is obviously very important. And that plays into the role of the cortisol through the hypothalamic pituitary axis, adrenal axis, and brain-derived neurotrophic factor. All of those things are changed, as is the serotonin level. It seems like people who commit suicide have the lowest level of serotonin. And the lower the level is, the more likely the person will undertake a violent means versus a nonviolent means. There are other chemicals involved in suicide. We just don't know their exact role, but there's norepinephrine and glutamine and there's GABA. There's the BDNF that I mentioned, and a variety of other factors. And then it might have something to do with infection. So there's a very common organism known as Toxoplasma gondii. And toxoplasmosis is a, uh, the disease that comes from it, but most people just are infected asymptomatically. It's estimated 40 million, 40 million people in the United States carry this parasite, parasite typically from cats. If we look at a 10-year follow-up of women who are infected, we find that the rate of suicide increases in direct proportion to the level of antibodies against the toxoplasma. And we find that those people who have significant levels have about a two-fold increase in the likelihood of committing suicide. So we have some kind of underlying psychopathology with 90% of the people committing suicide having depression, but only about half of them diagnosed at the time of death. It seems like it's mostly with major depressive disorder, but it also seems that the depression associated with bipolar disorder, not so much the manic state, but the depressed state, that also seems to be significantly evolved, and so is schizophrenia, and so are some psychotic disorders. And then there are compounding situations that also develop. And now, when we're talking about depression, you have to realize that symptoms of depression are difficult to diagnose at times. So if we look at adolescents and we compare them to adults, we find that we might have depression in an adolescent who's a quiet, perfectionistic, otherwise good boy who never seems to get in trouble, but can't sustain the level of perfection. And we have other boys who have conduct disorder, abrupt change in their behavior, change in their school performance. Maybe they have a different group of friends or they begin substance or chemical abuse or they act impulsively. Now, the parents claim that the child didn't have any mental problem prior to the time of suicide, but going back with those forensic autopsies, we find that, yes, indeed, depression is extraordinarily common. And in middle-aged people, we can have masked depression, where they complain not of the depression, not of the mood problem, but maybe they have uh, chest pain or they have chronic diseases that don't really fit the mold. Or maybe they've had recent surgery or they have a diagnosis of a terminal illness. And in elderly people, it's not that they become fearful and sad and seem to lack pleasure, but more often they become withdrawn and have change in their appetite or their sleep patterns or they have vague, nonspecific symptoms. Those people are 30-fold increase in the risk of committing suicide. Then we have to realize that most people who are depressed don't commit suicide. So what additional problems do they have to have? Well, on top of it, then we have hopelessness. And we have the perception that there's no reason to go on living. And that proceeds perhaps to some suicidal ideation. So in people who have depression, it's estimated that maybe as many as 10 to 15 percent commit suicide in bipolar disorder. The number might be as high as 15 to 20 percent. Now, those statistics are probably too high because they look at people who are more severely ill. But then on top of all of that, we have the personality uh, traits and we have the cognitive style. We have a demonstrated association of those abnormalities with suicidal behavior. 
and then we have the depression and we have the the anxiety and we have the interpersonal conflicts and we have the impulsive and aggressive behavior and then we have panic disorder or obsessive compulsive disorder or eating disorders and post-traumatic stress disorders and we have decreased restraint because the person has underlying conduct abnormalities or antisocial disease or maybe they have substance abuse and by the way depression is more common in women much more common in women than it is in men at least as far as diagnosis is concerned yet more men than women commit suicide. Another risk is schizophrenia, as I mentioned. There's about a 10% lifetime risk, especially in people who abruptly discontinue their medications or people who have hallucinations with voices telling them, hey, go commit suicide, go destroy yourself. The incidence often increased in people who have schizophrenia who also suffer from depression, often right after a relapse, and sometimes during improvement in people who have chronic remitting courses. Then we have medical disorders that might underlie suicide, might increase the risk of depression. So stroke or cardiovascular disease, heart attack, cancer, six times more common in men than in women shortly after hospital discharge or among people facing potentially mutilating surgery. People with sleep disorders. Sleep is extraordinarily important for health. Traumatic brain injuries. Well, there's a three to four fold increase in the incidence of suicide in people who are suffering from traumatic brain injuries. And then we have an assortment of multiple sclerosis, inflammatory bowel disease, epilepsy, HIV, even now, because of the stigma and the anxiety and the depression and social isolation in certain areas of the country that might come along with the disease, end-stage renal failure, and people who withdraw from taking the benzodiazepines. And other risk factors include alcohol, especially in depressed patients, and especially because the alcohol decreases the level of serotonin even more, people with drug, substance abuse, eating disorders, personality disorders, either inherited or developed during youth, especially the cluster B type personality disorders, the borderline personality, histrionic personality disorder, antisocial personality disorder. And then we have the copycat syndrome. Copycat caused by the name the Werther effect. The Werther from Goethe's book uh, known as The Sorrow of Young Werther. It was a book where the protagonist committed suicide, and as a result, people who read the book, who were so devoted to the book, they committed suicide too. And we have severe anxiety. That's also critically important. So we have people who unexpectedly commit suicide. A person without any kind of previous attempts, no threats. But if we look, up to 80% of the people, either directly or indirectly, communicate that they're considering some kind of a problem. They either give away their valued possessions or they engage in uncharacteristic and destructive behavior. Might be a new loss, an anniversary issue. Might be that in those who are under therapy, they've been talking to the psychiatrist, but the psychiatrist missed the change in affect. After all, a person who commits suicide seems to be more comfortable talking to family and friends than even to the therapist. And then underneath all of that, or on top of all of that, we have social and economic pressure. We have poor coping skills that the individuals have, poor problem-solving abilities. And that's on top of the depression and the hopelessness and the negative expectations about the future. And then all of a sudden they have a recent loss, loss in the relationship or the status, the occupation, the health their personal economics, often in a person who has impulsive disorder, and then add to that some alcohol or drugs. People who have alcohol or drug issues have more serious attempts. They have more lethal attempts, greater number of attempts, and all of that seems to be fostered by greater impulsivity. If a person communicates the potential that they're considering suicide, that person has a significant increase in the risk of committing suicide or completing suicide within the next two to ten years. So if you look at suicide in general, at least 50% of the people have mood disorder at the time that's diagnosed. About 25% have an alcohol problem, about 10% have psychosis, 5% have Parkinson's disease. According to one study, according to another study, 
looking at people who have the presence of mental health disorder, 40% of them taking an antidepressant at the time, well at suicide 75% suffered from depression and 15% from anxiety, 15% from the bipolar disorder, 5% from schizophrenia, 2% from attention deficit disorder, and then on top of all of that, the precipitating, the final event might have been life stress, a relationship problem, intimate partner problem, arguments and conflicts and recent loss or impending crisis, or job or financial problem or physical health problem that the individual had. And if we look, there's a considerable increase in the incidence of suicide shortly after discharge from a psychiatric facility, correctional facility, alcohol or drug rehabilitation facility, and even in children between the ages of 10 and 17. Maybe a recent crisis can be the precipitating act, drop in their school grades, bullying at school, mental health issues that are undiagnosed, or even parental problems. So what are the methods that people use to commit suicide? Well, between 2001 and 2015, the trend is to more expedient methods. So in those 15 years, 279,000 people committed suicide by shooting, by firearms. That's a startling number. Hanging or strangulation, suffocation, 130,000 people died in that 15-year period. Poisoning by drug, 71,000. Non-drug, pesticide or something like that. Another 21,000. Other methods, about 12,000. A lot of people try to avoid pain and disfigurement. But still, suicide by firearm counts for 60% of all deaths overall strangulation, suffocation, hanging, about 25%, except in the 10 to 17 year old age group where it increases to about 50%. Method of poisoning can be over-the-counter drugs and about a third of the poisonings. Another third has to do with opioids. Significant number of those individuals also are taking the benzodiazepines, the anti-anxiety drugs. Well, overall, the poisoning is less lethal than the shooting, of course, or the hanging, but we have people who now are committing suicide by ingesting pesticides, and of course, people jump. Where do people commit suicides? Well, 85% of them, either at home or in their apartment, women tend to leave notes more often than men, and at the time of death, about 20% of the individuals had at least one substance in the body, a substance like alcohol or cocaine or amphetamine or marijuana or the opiates. They don't consider the toll, but it's considerable on the family and the loved ones. It seems that the toll is greater than with death that would follow a long medical illness. People have more guilt. Well, suicide obviously is a fatal self-injury. If we look at completed suicides, one completed suicide occurs for every eight to ten attempts if we look at the number of people. But if we look at the number of events, we have one completed suicide for every eight to twenty-five attempts because it seems that many people attempt suicide more than once. But about two-thirds of the suicides don't have a previous attempt. The suicide is the first act. Now if we look at the suicide attempts, there are about 500,000 people who visit emergency rooms each year because of potentially fatal self-injuries. They were trying to commit suicide, especially in younger white females, oftentimes who suffer from an Axis II disorder on top of their depression. Maybe they have the narcissistic personality disorder, histrionic borderline personality disorder. It's distinct, but it overlaps with completed suicides. People who try to commit suicide, people with the attempts, have significantly more functional impairment than people who have non-suicidal self-injuries. It seems, however, that somewhere between 8 to 20 percent of people who attempt suicide ultimately kill themselves, oftentimes within the first one to five years after the attempt, which is about a hundred times greater than the average population. And if we look at people over age 65, one in four attempts 
one in four attempts, considerably greater than average, ends up in a completed suicide. Now, some people have suicidal ideation. They think about suicide. And 12-month incidence in our society is about 22 to 20 percent. But only about less than one-half of one percent actually act on those ideas. These are people who think about ending their life and in the active stage, they've already identified the method, they have a plan, they have intent to act on the plan. Those people are at increased risk, but fortunately, relatively few, no more than a third, are going to attempt a suicide. And then there are a lot of people who think about suicide, but they don't have any plan. they just thinking about it because they're under some kind of stress at the time. Then we have, of course, the non-suicidal self-injury. These people have no intent to die. They're completely different than people who have suicide attempts as far as motivation, family transmission is concerned, age. At onset, these people tend to be younger. Different kind of psychopathology. They're less impaired. These are the people who repetitively cut themselves or burn themselves. They do that to relieve some kind of a distress or to get attention, to escape from some kind of a difficult situation or maybe to feel something or as a form of self-punishment. Well, when you evaluate your friends who seem to be depressed, you don't want to ask them, hey, you're not thinking about committing suicide, are you? But, but rather you might want to say something like, do you sometimes feel so terrible that sometimes you wish you were never born? What do you see yourself doing in five years? And if they have a positive answer to any of those questions, you might ask them, if they've had any thoughts about hurting themselves, and what were they? And have you ever acted on the plans? Do you have a plan? Do you have the means available? And with that kind of information, then you should discuss with somebody who can help those individuals. Patients don't seem to be, or the individuals don't seem to be offended. They actually seem to be relieved that somebody cares for them. Now, do we have any medicines to prevent suicide? Sure. Well, we have lithium. Lithium seems to probably be the best medicine at the present time, but then we have clozapine. And now they're talking about ketamine, or the new nasal spray, S-ketamine. question is about the SSRIs. Are they any good? Well, there's an argument about them. Certainly they're safer in overdose than the MAO inhibitors that we used to use, the tricyclic antidepressants. But in 2004, the FDA mandated the black box warning on all antidepressants that hey, they might cause a person to commit suicide. The American College of Neuropsychopharmacology had a task force on SSRIs and suicidal behavior in youth, and they said they don't have any evidence that they increase the number of suicides. They might increase the suicidal ideation or thinking about suicide, but they don't increase the incidence of suicide. The FDA has said that, hey, this black box warning doesn't seem to have any direct effect and as a matter of fact, according to them, the SSRIs, at least, don't seem to reduce the incidence of suicide. Well, how do we prevent suicide? There's genetic counseling. We can focus on increasing a person's quality of life. We have the ability to reduce social isolation. We have better treatment of depression. We can, in the schools, increase recognition of depression, junior high school, senior high school, we can have self-referrals, we can encourage self-help. The question is, does any of that really help? We have community-based activities, secular or through the church. We have increased social support. You have all these 24-hour hotlines, but nobody knows if they really do anything. Well, if we look at people who have tried to commit suicide, who have attempted it, and gone to the hospital, and we just send them a letter. Just the fact sending them a letter in the couple months after they've been in the hospital, that can reduce the incidence of suicide, completed suicides, by about 20%. And again, in people who have been discharged from psychiatric institutions, who were suicidal, who for whatever reason don't seek follow-up care, just getting in contact with them reduces the incidence of suicide. So we have the potential, potential on a population level, 
through increasing social cohesion to potentially improve a person's lot. But the way we're going now in society, there seems to be a lack of social cohesion. We have a lack of social structure and value. We have turmoil economically and socially. And then we have all those predisposing factors. We have the family history and the genes and the epigenetic problems. And we have the abuse and neglect. And then we have the developmental problems associated with the personality traits and the cognitive deficits and the impaired memory and problem solving. Then we have the individual factors, anxiety, impulsive aggression, chronic substance problems. We have the media reports. We have the access of method, but we have the decrease in access to mental health. And all of that, with some life stress on top of the psychopathology, in people who are hopeless, who have social isolation, maybe they're going to start thinking about suicide. Then some of those will start to attempt suicide. And ultimately, some people will commit suicide. Well, the World Suicide Day is September 10th. That was named by the World Health Organization, the International Society for Prevention of Suicide. So keep your eyes and your ears open. Keep your minds open. Suicide's a major health issue. And remember, it's a culmination of a variety of facts, often on the background of recognized or unrecognized depression, and perhaps compounded by an adverse childhood and some genetic problems and mixed in with hopelessness and despair. And it's finally punctuated by some kind of a precipitating social disaster to the person. And that person feels unable to cope. And unfortunately, they commit suicide. But timely and appropriate intervention can avert the whole situation. Anyway, thanks for watching. I'm Dr. Ken Landau.